Hello, I'm Max from the University of Southampton. In this video, we'll be talking about the Navier Stokes equation in more detail than part 1. Navier Stokes equations represent the cornerstone of fluid dynamics, which are only solvable through numerical methods. This is why, in the year 2000, the Clave Mathematics Institute offers a 1 million US dollar prize for proving that analytical solutions exist for the Navier Stokes equations. And to this day, it is still one of the seven millennium prize problems. These equations are useful because they can describe all kinds of fluid flows, from ocean currents to blood flow, water flow in the tap, to airflow around the windfall, etc. These are the Navier Stokes equations, which look somewhat difficult, but they essentially represent Newton's second law applied to a fluid. When we analyze a large body of fluid, we assume it is made of many small elements, which can take any possible shape. For simplicity, let's assume they are small cubes. Then whatever is true for this little cube will be true for its neighbors and for the neighbors of these neighbors, and so on. In other words, we can understand the whole body of fluid if we understand what happens to a small component of it. So in this video, let's take a cube from a body of water and apply Newton's second law to it. Using Newton's second law, sum of forces acting on the cube is equal to its mass times acceleration. The frame of reference will be x1, x2, and x3 instead of x, y, and z. This is easier for future notation. The volume of the cube is the product of dx1, dx2, and dx3, where dx1, dx2, and dx3 are the lengths of the cube. The total force acting on this cube consists of body force and surface forces. The body force is commonly known as weight, and it is the density of the fluid times volume times gravitational acceleration. Remember that the mass of the cube is equal to the density, rho, times the volume. The surface forces consist of pressure force and viscous force acting on the surface of the cube. Surface forces will apply stresses on the surface of the cube, which can be represented by the fluid stress tensor here. This animation shows where the stresses act on each phase, the green arrows are the normal stresses and the yellow arrows are the shear stresses. The opposite faces would experience stresses showing dashed arrows that relate to their solid counterparts, as we will see soon. These sigmas have suffix notation ij, where i is the direction of the stress and j is a surface element or face that is normal to the axis xj. Sigma 1 1, sigma 2 2 and sigma 3 3 are the normal stresses and the rest are the shear stresses. Here's an example. Take a look at the right side of the cube. The normal stress is sigma 1 1, sigma 2 1 and sigma 3 1 are shear stresses. Remember the first little number shows the direction of the stress and the last small number shows the surface element that is perpendicular to the axis. In this case, to the axis x1. The stresses on the other faces are as shown. Surface forces are pressure force and viscous forces and they can be represented by the fluid stress on the surface of the material volume. The fluid stress is the sum of pressure and shear stresses. Let's break it down. Assume the fluid is at rest. There's pressure from outside of the material volume, which always acts normal to each face. Multiply pressure by the area of each face and you have pressure force. Now we look at the shear stress. Remember the cube is surrounded by other cubes within the water body. So when the fluid is moving, the cubes will shear along each other's faces and cause shear stresses on the faces. Multiply that shear stress by the area of the face it acts on and we obtain the viscous force, 
which is a measure of fluid's resistance to flow. We only consider Newtonian fluid, such as water or air, where the shear stress is linearly proportional to the shear strain rate. Mu is the dynamic viscosity, and Sij is the rate of strain. Remember, the strain is the, the deformation of the cube, and the rate of strain is how fast it deforms. Or in other words, how easily the fluid flows. We will see how the viscous force is derived from the shear stress. The cube's top and bottom faces are being sheared. In 2D view, we can see the deformation of the cube. In 3D view, the cube will be a parallel pipette. When the cube is being sheared, apart from tile 1, 3 on the top and bottom faces, in general, there may be an extra component of shear stress, which is the change of stress along x3 direction. Times that by dx3, we obtain the new component, which is essentially the change that may occur to tau 1, 3, delta tau 1, 3. Stress acts on an area, so times by dx1 and dx2. Take the difference between the top phase and the bottom phase, you see that tau 1, 3 cancels out. What you're left with is the change of stress along dx3 and times by the area. We then get the net viscous force that acts on the top and bottom faces. And the bit at the end is simplified as the volume of the cube. Note something important. The viscous force depends not on the shear stress tau, but on the change or gradient of the shear stress, delta tau in delta x. Now that we put all the stresses together, in one equation, the fluid stress is this. Using a similar procedure as before, when we looked at shear stresses, the surface force will look in general like this. Before moving on, let me just quickly introduce you the meaning of repeated suffix notation and the Kronecker delta. Take a look at this term. Because this term has repeated suffix k, this means the sum of different combinations. To make it clearer, here is an example. SKK would equal to the sum of S01, S22, and S33. Therefore, this term would look like this when expanded out. This term also relates to the compressibility of the fluid. If the fluid is incompressible, like water, then this term is equal to zero. This is the Kronecker delta. It just means when i equal j, the delta is one, otherwise it's zero. Now let's put all the forces together. You have the body force and the surface force and combine them, you get this. Substitute the fluid stress tensor we have just learned. We have completed the right-hand side of the Navier-Stokes equations. Moving on to the second half of Newton's second law, the acceleration. Remember that the mass is density times volume. This video shows a constant flow rate through a hose. By putting the thumb over the end, I alter the area and the water exit velocity increases. What you just saw in the animation is a fluid particle acceleration towards the nozzle, which exhibits the same behavior as the previous video. This is simply because of the continuity equation. The volumetric flow rate coming in must be equal to the flow rate going out, as the initial area is larger than the nozzle, so the velocity of the flow is slower upstream than exiting the nozzle. Back to defining the acceleration for the fluid. Acceleration is change in velocity over change in time, or rate of change of velocity. The speed of our fluid elements, such as the blue circle you see below, depends on the position and time. 
so that by using the chain rule you obtain this equation, which can be separated into these two terms, which we call local acceleration and convective acceleration. Remember, partial differentiation means ignore changes due to all variables except for those caused by small variation to the variables shown in the denominator. So for our first term, which is the local acceleration, we fix all other terms which have to do with position and see how the velocity depends on time in the given fixed position. For steady flow, there is no local acceleration because the velocity remains constant in time in a given point of the fluid. For example, if you turn on the tab and leave it running, there is definitely some flow velocity, but in any given point, that flow velocity is always the same in time. We say that this flow is steady, and its local acceleration is zero. But if you now turn off the tap slowly, the flow velocity changes with time. The flow has become unsteady and has a non-zero local acceleration. To understand the convective acceleration, we now inquire whether the velocity depends on the position. As we saw before, because of continuity, the initial velocity and final velocity of our fluid elements are different at different locations of x. In our example of the nozzle, where flow is steady, in other words not changing time at one given point, so the local acceleration equals zero, but the fluid element, the blue circle, is definitely being accelerated as it approaches the end of the nozzle. This acceleration must come from somewhere. Well, it comes from the second term in our equation, the convective acceleration. Just a side note, you see this bit at the end? It's distance over time, so it's a velocity. So we have everything we need to define the Navier-Stokes equations. Remember that it's just f equal ma. So we have the forces here, and the mass times acceleration. We put them together and divide through by the volume because this equation needs to work for all sized elements. But what you would normally find in a textbook is the other way around. You have acceleration on the left and the forces on the right. When you expand it out, it is very long. You notice here is the pressure gradient which is essentially the driving force for the fluid to flow from a higher pressure to a lower pressure, as we saw in part 1 video. There are other famous fluid dynamics equations that we can relate to the Navier-Stokes equation by applying certain assumptions or simplifications. We have the Euler's equation, which is used for inviscid flow, so the viscosity is zero and so are the terms containing mu. This is the Euler's equation, which is often used to simulate, for instance, airflow because air has very little viscosity. We can further simplify the equation by integrating Euler's equation along the streamline, which the flow would be steady, incompressible, and inviscid. This is the Bernoulli's equation, commonly used for problems in civil engineering hydraulics, such as flow through pipes. If you would like to learn more about Bernoulli's equation, please click the link below. And if we say the fluid is at rest, then it has no velocity. And all you left with is these two terms. Integrate them and you get the hydrostatic equation, pressure equal rho times g times the depth. That is why the Navier-Stokes equations are the cornerstone of fluid dynamics. They connect to all these other equations. But remember, all this is just F equal ma. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, like and comment below.